As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Hey friends, my name is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in Palace Square in front of Russia's Winter Palace, which was the palace for the Romanov family during the winters. And this week I've been telling you what new arrivees may have felt when they first walked into this magnificent, opulent palace. It was beyond anything they had ever seen. Even those who came from Europe had never seen opulence or extravagance on this level. When they walked up the Jordan staircase and saw the huge, beautiful columns, the embellishments in that staircase covered with more than 11 pounds of gold, 11 pounds of gold. This room simply glistened as the sun streamed in through the windows from the side of the Neva River. Finally, when they came to the top of the stairs, they would walk into the field marshal room, a room that was covered with enormous paintings of past military field marshals and chandeliers, one so huge it weighed more than three tons. From there, they were walked into the memorial room of Peter the Great, where there was a throne never used by him, but it was there as a commemoration of Peter the Great's great rule of Russia and from there, they walked into a room which was called the Coat of Arms Room, a room dedicated to the ruling families of Russia and all of their contributions to the Russian Empire. And that room was decked with more than 18 pounds of gold embellishments. And from there, they walked into the next room, which was the military gallery of the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was Russia's conflict with Napoleon. And of course, Russia won. Alexander I drove Napoleon out of Russia. And this particular gallery was built to commemorate their victory over Napoleon in 1812. The halls of this gallery contain 332 portraits of the generals who fought in the war with Napoleon in 1812. At the far end of the gallery hangs a portrait of Emperor Alexander I himself, the emperor who led the charge against Napoleon. And you'll notice there are 13 frames that are empty. Why are they empty? Because these were for the generals who were no longer living at the time that the portraits were painted, but they were not forgotten. Even though the frames today remain empty, there are empty frames there to commemorate those whose faces are no longer remembered. 10 years, after the completion of the gallery, it was destroyed by a massive fire in 1837, but it was reconstructed, and today the hall stands nearly as it was before the Great Fire. But this hall was intended to commemorate those who had done something great. These were generals who had fought in the War of 1812. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 is. It's God's hall of faith. God commemorates simple people who heard from him, who got into alignment with him and did what he asked them to do. And because they obeyed, they became someone significant. And that is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. Thank you for letting me come right into your space. And as I told you in the introduction to today's program today, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, which I call God's Hall of Faith. It's where God commemorates simple people who did something significant with their lives. And when you look at all the characters in Hebrews chapter 11, it is amazing that God chose nearly any of them because they were just so common but that's who God likes to choose. Just regular folks who hear from him and align themselves with his word and with his promise and they refuse to budge from what God said. And in their time and in their age, they changed their generation. They were generation changers. And that's what you can be if you'll hear from God and stand by whatever he tells you to do or wherever he tells you to be. But it would be good for you to order the whole series, 
which is called God's Hall of Faith, and it comes with a study guide. I think you know I really like my study guides. We put a lot of work into this for you because we want to create for you a banquet of teaching you can trust, and here it is. So order yours today. We're also offering you my daily devotionals called Sparkling Gems from the Greek. This is volume one, but there's also volume two. And in each one of these volumes, there's 1,000 Greek word studies, actually more than that. And there's really no duplicate information between these two volumes. You can begin with number one or number two. It really doesn't matter, but it's a daily devotional. You don't have to read the whole thing at once. You just read a little bit every day, and every day, day by day, with Brother Rick, you can dive into the New Testament and extract treasures. And that's why I call this Sparkling Gems from the Greek. And if you're not a partner with our ministry, please pray about joining us as a partner to help us take this teaching around the world. Proverbs 10, 21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many. That's our assignment. It is to feed many the Word of God. And when you become a partner with our ministry, you help us take this teaching to people that are famished for it. There are people crying out for the teaching of the Bible. And through the medium of television, we can come to them and bring them teaching that they can trust. And the moment you become a partner, we'll send you a couple books as our way of saying, welcome to the partner family. We'll send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. It's small, but my friends, it is dynamite. And we'll send you my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to our partners. But hey, Let's reach for our Bibles. And let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. And today, we're going to see what to do with your faith when you begin to get older. How old are you? You know, my grandmother, when she was old, she said, Ah, oh, Ricky, I'm of no value to anybody. I just sit in my chair all day long, and all I do is pray. I said, Grandma, what are you talking about? It may be the most beneficial thing you've ever done with your life. This is a moment for you to shift your faith into the future for the next generation. If you feel you've come to the end of your life or you're in your latter years and you've not seen all your dreams come to pass, don't give up. Shift your faith for those things to come to pass for your kids and for your grandkids. It's time for you to shift your faith for things to happen in the future. And I'm going to show you this today in Hebrews chapter 11 as we look at the examples of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But let's go back to Hebrews 11, verse 1, where the writer of Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I hope you really have gotten that word substance by now. If you haven't, then listen to me again, because I want to cover it. It's so very important for you to understand this word substance. In Greek, it is so entirely different than the King James translation. In Greek, it is the word hupostasis, a compound of two words. The word hupo means by. The word stasis is a form of the Greek word histomy, which means to stand. But when you compound the two words together, this word substance in Greek, the word hupostasis means to stand by something. It is the attitude and actions of one who has determined to stand by something promised and who refuses to budge from it. It is a fixed decision that one will be unmoving, and he will stay or stand by a person, principle, promise, or territory. He is not going to move from what has been promised to him. He is going to stand by it. It is the unbudging, unflinching attitude. This is mine. I will never release it. I'm not moving from it. I'm going to stand by what I'm hoping for. And really, Hebrews 11 verse 1 is not the definition of faith. It is the behavior of faith. Faith is like a bulldog that has found the bone of its dreams. It latches its jaws around that promise and says, I'm never going to let loose. It's going to stand by that promise. Then when you come to Hebrews 11 verse 2, it says, for by it, by what? By faith. This unbendable, unbreakable, never give up kind of faith. The elders obtained a good report. Elders refers to people in the Old Testament. Verse 3, through faith, again, through this unbendable, unbreakable, never give up kind of faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God. The word worlds is the Greek word which describes a past period, a past generation, a past time. 
When the Bible says the worlds were framed, the word framed is a Greek word which means to change, to amend, to adjust, or to alter the form or shape of something that already exists. It is recreating, reshaping, remolding, modifying. It is the act of altering something that is already in existence. It is not the idea of creation. Rather, it is the idea of transformation. Then the verse goes on to say that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. The Greek says by a word from God. Well, when you put all of that together, Hebrews 11.3 should be translated through faith. And again, we understand it's this unbendable, unbreakable, never give up kind of faith that is standing by what has been promised. Through this kind of faith, we understand that different time periods, different generations in the past have been completely reshaped. Different generations have been completely altered by individuals who received a word from God. That is the power you have when you receive a word from God and refuse to budge from it. And we've already seen in Scripture these examples of Enoch. Enoch received a word from God that he would never see death. He stood by it and he received the manifestation. We saw the example of Noah. The Bible says he was warned of God. God communicated with Noah and Noah understood what was coming. He received a divine mandate. And even though society sneered at him and laughed at him for what he was doing, he refused to budge from his assignment. And because he was faithful to stand by his word from God, Noah changed history. And aren't we glad that he did? We saw the example of Abraham. Abraham, a pagan rich man living in Mesopotamia who received a visitation from God. God spoke to him. He aligned himself with that word from God. And even though it took a very long time for the word to come to pass, he refused to budge from that word. He stood by it until he received the manifestation and he became the father of faith. We saw the example of Sarah in the last program. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible explicitly says physically she was sterile. She was unable to produce children, but she received strength. She reached out by faith. She engaged her faith and took hold of the dynamic power of God, which enabled her body to conceive seed. And she gave birth to a son whom she named Isaac. These were all impossible deeds. But these individuals who heard from God, aligned themselves with what God said. And just like Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, they stood by what they were hoping for, the word hypostasis. They refused to move. They refused to budge. They were unflinching. Now, friend, I'm telling you, life tried to take the promise away from them, but they refused to let go. I don't know what God has promised you, but you can be sure the devil will try to talk you out of it. People will try to talk you out of it. Life will pull on you to try to get you to move out of a place of faith. You have to decide, I'm not budging. I'm not flinching. Faith stands still, and I'm not moving until I receive the full manifestation of God's promise to my life. Wow. And that's why Hebrews 11:6 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The word without, again, is the Greek word chorus, which means to be outside of something. And I've told you in nearly every program, it depicts somebody that's either in or out. You can't be in the house and outside the house at the same time. You can only be in the house or outside of the house. If you're outside of the house, then you're no longer in the house. This word without describes somebody who's no longer in faith. They've moved out of faith. They have abandoned their promise, maybe because they're tired or they're discouraged. They've abandoned their promise and they have moved out of a place of faith. And if you abandon what God has told you, this verse says you cannot please God. That's literally what verse 6 means. Without faith, moving out of a place of faith, you cannot please God. And it goes on to say, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him is a Greek word, which in this case portrays one that is hardworking, attentive, busy, constant, and persistent in his devotion to receive the thing that he is seeking. 
This tells us it takes real diligence to stay in a place of faith. That's why you need to listen to good faith teaching. You need to listen to teaching that you can trust. It helps you stay in your place of faith. It takes real diligence to stay in a place of faith. You need to undergird yourself with teaching that will help you stay there. But today we're going to come to Hebrews 11, verse 20, and we're going to begin looking at the example of Isaac. Listen to what the Bible says. Hebrews 11, verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Wow. Isaac had come to the end of his life. He knew he was about to die. Everything he was believing for had not come to pass yet. Rather than just say, well, it didn't happen, he shifted his faith to believe the promise of God would come on the next generation. If you're older, it may be time for you to shift your faith to believe for your kids and for your grandkids. Shift your faith for the next generation. And the Bible says, by faith, through this unbendable, unbreakable, never give up kind of faith. Here Isaac was old. But he said, I'm not budging. The promise was made to me. And even though I personally have not seen the manifestation of it, I'm going to shift my faith and release my faith to believe it's going to come on my kids. And the Bible says he blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. The word blessed is the Greek word eulogia from the word you, which describes something good or swell. The word logos, which is the word for words. When you compound this together, it means to speak good or pleasurable words or words that confer a blessing. Rather than say, my promise didn't happen, the Bible tells us Isaac engaged his faith and engaged his mouth and began to release his faith for the next generation. You can do that as well. Then when we come to Hebrews 11, verse 21, we read about Jacob. And the Bible says, by faith... Jacob, what kind of faith? This unbendable, unbreakable faith that refuses to give up. By this kind of faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he came to the end of his life and he had not yet seen all the manifestations of what he was believing for rather than say, well, it didn't work. He, when he was dying, decided to shift his faith for his kids and his grandkids. He shifted his faith for the next generation. The Bible says when he was dying, The word dying here means he was withering away. He waited to the very last moment before he shifted his faith to the next generation. When he was dying, he blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. This word blessed is again a form of the Greek word eulogia from the word eu, which describes something good or swell. The word logos, which is the Greek word for words. When you compound the two words together, the word blessing means to speak good words, words that convey a blessing. He was conveying a blessing to the next generation. That is the power of words. If you want to bless someone, you have to engage your mouth. Blessings are spoken from the mouth. We read about this in Ephesians chapter 1 when the Bible says we have been blessed with every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus. It means God himself has spoken good things over us in Christ. God has released his blessings on us. He has spoken his blessing into our lives. And now when we come to this verse, we find that Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his Staff, the word worshiped is even important because it tells us something about the heart of Jacob. It is a Greek word proskuneo. The word pros means toward or forward. The word kuneo is the Greek word that means to kiss. When you compound the two words together, it forms the Greek word proskuneo, which when compounded depicts one who falls on the ground towards someone in order to kiss. It was used to depict a person's worshipful position before the Lord. It pictures one who has prostrated himself, either outwardly or inwardly, bowing in his heart before God and is worshiping and blowing kisses of adoration toward God. Now we find that Jacob, when he was dying, said, it's time for me to worship. And he entered into a place of intimacy with God, leaning On the top of his staff, leaning is the Greek word epi, which means he had to lean on his staff. He was so frail. And he began speaking words of blessing 
over his sons and over his future generations. He shifted his faith for the next generation. Even when he was dying, his faith did not budge. It did not move. He refused to let go of the promises that had been made to him. And that's what you need to do as well. Then the Bible tells us this. Are you ready for this? In Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph. Here we have Joseph. What kind of faith? This unbendable, unbreakable faith that refuses to let go by faith, Joseph, when he died. The word died here is the Greek word which means when he was finishing, when he was coming to a conclusion, when he had reached his end, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. The word mentioned is a Greek word that denotes a written record to memorialize a person's actions. It was a memorial intended to be permanent. It means to remember, to recollect, to mention, to commemorate, or to memorialize. This tells us that when Joseph made this statement, he wanted everyone to remember what he was saying. They were to never forget it. They were to recollect his promise in this verse. And what did he promise? What did he prophesy? He spoke of the departing of the children of Israel. The word departing in Greek, guess what? It is the word exodus. He prophesied the exodus. He prophesied the exodus and gave commandment concerning his bones. The word commandment really is the Greek word for instruction. He told them what to do with his bones. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Joseph knew the children of Israel would make an exodus from Egypt, but he had never seen the exodus and knew he would not see it in his life. Rather than say, well, the promise of God never came to pass, he shifted his faith for the next generation. He knew it would take so long for them to make the exodus, the flesh would be gone from his bones, all that would be left is bones, and he was right because the exodus occurred nearly 200 years after his death but he gave instructions. We're going to get up. We're going to move out of this place. I'm going to go with you. Even if I go as bones, take my bones. He prophesied it. Rather than say, well, it never happened in my life. He shifted his faith for the next generation. And when you come to Exodus 13, verse 19, the Bible says that Moses took the bones of jo Joseph with him. It is amazing. All of these individuals, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they stood in faith for the promise of God and hypostasis. They stood by it and refused to let go of it. They stood by the promise that had been made to them. And when they came to the end, when they hadn't seen all of it fulfilled, they didn't just wash their hands and say, well, this didn't work. They said, hey, it's time for me to shift my faith for the next generation. What has been promised to me is going to happen. Even if it doesn't happen to me, it's going to happen to my kids and it's going to happen to my grandkids. And they shifted their faith to believe for the next generation. Maybe that's what you need to do. Open your mouth and begin to speak a blessing over your family because they're going to be inheritors of all the promises that God has made to you. And when I come back in just a moment, I want to pray for you. Hebrews 11 describes people who received a word from God and obeyed it, no matter what the cost. Despite others' words of discouragement, opposition, and the odds being stacked against them, these men and women received a word from God and held on to that word with bulldog faith. They refused to let go of what God had promised them until they saw the promise fulfilled. And because of their tenacity, they changed history. In this in-depth 10-part series, God's Hall of Faith, based on Hebrews 11, Rick Renner will teach you how to hold fast to your God-given promise, how to not cast away your faith when you get tired, how to have bulldog faith that never lets go, how to live in the address of faith, and so much more. This jam-packed 10-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the books, Sparkling Gems from the Greek, Volumes 1 and 2. In these books, Rick unlocks brilliant treasures within God's Word and shows you how to live an intimate, uncompromising life with God. In an easy-to-read devotional format, each volume of Sparkling Gems explores more than 1,000 in-depth Greek word studies. Order Sparkling Gems 1 for just $45 and Sparkling Gems 2 for only $45.
Don't miss this special offer. God's Hall of Faith and Sparkling Gems 1 and Sparkling Gems 2. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My name is Joel Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your help is helping us change the lives of people all around the world, especially the street kids of Moscow. Moscow is home to over 20 million people and many children with special needs, but especially children who live on the streets. Because of our partners, we're able to help assist the House of Mercy impact homeless children. House of Mercy is a foster home that has rescued hundreds of children from the streets or from other bad situations and has given them a new chance at life. One of these children is Vita. He was abandoned as a toddler and was raised by dogs until he was rescued by the House of Mercy. Some call this the Mowgli Syndrome, a name taken from the character from the classic Jungle Book story. Because of your gift and the work we are doing at the House of Mercy, Vita is now a healthy child. He is going to school, is being restored after receiving spiritual, emotional, and physical care by the House of Mercy. This is just one story of how the House of Mercy has helped hundreds of children reclaim their lives and fulfill their destinies. This is all possible due to the partners who support our work. Will you consider becoming a partner so that we can continue changing other homeless children's lives like Vita? Right now, right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner in this important work. Please call or go online to reno.org. Because of your gift of any size, we can continue to make this huge difference in children's lives. Children like Vita. Thank you for the privilege of letting me come right into your space today. And I want to tell you that if you need somebody to pray with you for anything on your heart, call us or send us an email. We're waiting to hear from you right now. As soon as the phone rings or as soon as your email shows up in our inbox, we're going to begin to put our faith with you for God to move in your life and to answer whatever it is that's on your heart. And it would be such a privilege for us to hear from you so we can begin to pray right now. And we're offering you my series, which is called God's Hall of Faith. Today, we've been looking at the faith of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and how they shifted their faith for the next generation. You can do that too. This series will just strengthen you, and it comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you my daily devotionals, which are called Sparkling Gems from the Greek, number one, and Sparkling Gems from the Greek, number two. These devotionals are filled with treasures and that's why I call them sparkling gems from the Greek. The subtitle says 365 Greek word studies for every day of the year to sharpen your understanding of God's word. It is a daily devotional. You don't read the whole thing at once. You just read a little bit every day. As I take you into the pages of the New Testament and we begin to extract treasures that you have never seen before that will really enrich your life. But I want to pray for you. Father, thank you so much. Oh, Lord, that our faith works. Even if we come to the end of our lives, we can shift our faith to believe for the next generation. Thank you for that. Help us to stand by your promise and never let go of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I can hardly wait to get back tomorrow as we're going to look at the example of Moses. It's going to be great. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.